This is God's day. It's a good day. So let us rejoice. My name is Kim Gillow, and I'd like to welcome you again to our online worship here at Cotton United Church. And reminding you that we do have in-person worship on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock along with Junior Church. You're welcome to join us for those as well. But also to remind you that on June the 4th, we will not be having worship in our sanctuary on Sunday morning because we're gathering together with other United Churches at Guestwood Camp at 11 o'clock for worship together with other churches. Uh, they'll be followed by a barbecue uh, ending around 2 o'clock. So you're welcome to go to Guestwood Camp next Sunday, June the 4th, and share in that experience as well. Also, I would like to just remind you that I am retiring this week. And uh, this will be the last recorded message together. I want to thank you for joining together in this worship experience for the last almost three and a half years since COVID began. We're hoping to continue on with these recorded messages. They are popular. Uh, and what we're hoping to do is take the previous Sunday's uh, live stream, edit it down so that it's a very similar format to what we have right now. Uh, we are looking for someone to help with the editing. If you have even a small bit of computer knowledge, uh, we can set you up to help you do ed the editing, uh, so help, help in this ministry. If you're willing to do that, able to do that, give us a call. We'd love to have you take part in this ministry. Well, my friends, with that in mind, let's worship God. The earth is full of the majesty of God. As long as we have breath, we will sing to the living one. May our words and our rejoicings be pleasing to our living God. Praise be to the, to the Lord forever. Let's pray. Breathe on us, breath of God, and fill us with life anew. Help us to love what you love and do what you would have us do. Send your Holy Spirit into our gathering anoint and refresh us, blow through us and around us. As we worship this day, may we glow with the divine fire of Pentecost. Make us like Jesus who brought your divine healing to a hurting world. Make us like the disciples who shared his salvation message with all people. Come, Holy Spirit, come now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, this is my last Sunday at Cotton United Church, at least as the lead minister. And people have asked, how do you feel about that? And it feels weird, but strangely appropriate. The truth is that all good things must come to an end. When we came to Cotton 19 years ago, we, we knew it would not last forever. All pastoral relationships will someday end. But it's been an amazing ride and we have been blessed and most happy to be here. But I wondered, on the last Sunday, what scripture does one use? What, what message does one provide? It is Pentecost, and we could use the Pentecost readings, which I love, the, the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. We could use those readings. But I decided instead to go back to my favorite book in the Bible. And if you know me at all, and you know what my preferences are, you'll know that my favorite book of the Bible is Revelation. I, not because I think it's a crystal ball to tell us about the future, because I don't think it is. At least most of it's not. Some of it is. But it's actually more of a discipleship manual that if properly read and if those images are understood, it tells us everything that we need to know about how to be faithful Christians in a world which is sometimes opposed to our faith. Today, I want to look at Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13. It's a, it's a letter of Jesus to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 2 and 3 are letters that Jesus wrote to each of the seven churches of Asia Minor. And they have similarities in format, but this church in Philadelphia is special. Why? Because of all the churches in Asia Minor, it is the one that is most perfect. Jesus commends it for everything that it does. In all the other churches, there were some issues. They had wandered away from the faith. They, had, they, they were lukewarm. They put up with false prophets. Many things. 
but the church in Philadelphia, Jesus finds nothing wrong with it. It is a church that is be, to be commended, the epitome of what a church should be like. Is that appropriate to read on my last Sunday here in Cottam? Does that say that the church in Cottam is perfect? Well, I think that would be a bit high-handed. I think we could all agree with that. But the church in Philadelphia is the standard toward which we strive as the people of God to be the people of God. And so we're going to use Jesus' words to the church of Philadelphia to end up this series, this ministry. Beginning in Revelation 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus begins this passage by making three personal claims about himself. The first thing he says is that he is holy. In the book of Isaiah, God is referred to as the Holy One. And so for Jesus to say that he is holy reply, re reflects the fact that Jesus believes that he is God. He is not merely a man. He is not merely someone who came to do good things and teach good things. Rather, he is God incarnate. Jesus is divine. That's the first thing. He is holy. He is divine. The second thing he says is that he is true. Jesus hates all that is error. He hates all that is evil. There is nothing false about him. He is not just God incarnate. He is truth incarnate. In Jesus is truth, for he is truth himself, and he shares truth. He is holy. He is true. And the third thing he says is that he holds the key of David. What does that mean? In the Bible, a key is a symbol of authority. With the key, Jesus locks and unlocks the doors. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. So what doors are we talking about that Jesus opens and shuts? We're going to look at two doors, two types of doors this morning. The first is a door of salvation. Jesus holds a key. He holds a key to the door of salvation, for he is salvation. Only do we have salvation through him. John 14 and 6, Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says that he is the door of salvation, salvation to be with God. Through him, through the doors he unlocks, we get to be with God and be reconciled to God. He reminds us of that in Revelation. The other door he opens is a door of opportunity. We are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We are called to witness to the love of God in Jesus. We are called to witness to do that, to, to, to walk through that door as well. We've talked a lot about doors the last few weeks. We've talked about how Jesus opens those doors. But one of the most difficult doors to walk through is a door of witnessing, of sharing our faith. We sometimes find that uncomfortable. We want to do that. It's the right thing to do, but it has proved sometimes to be difficult. And yet still God opens those doors for us to witness to other people. Sometimes we're afraid to do that. We don't want to offend them. We don't want to seem too preachy. We don't know how to do it. We're afraid of not having the right words or the proper theology. It's hard. And because it's hard, sometimes we miss those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those who need to hear. How do we change that? We change that by looking at two things, two ways of sharing. The first way of sharing, the most obvious one, is with our words. What does faith mean to you? What is your faith? How has Jesus made a difference in your life? What, are, what, what words can you use to share your faith with somebody, somebody else? Words are crucial, but so are our actions, because through our actions, we also share our faith. But note this, our words and our actions have to line up, because those who are seeking faith, those who are seekers will spot a hypocrite a mile away, and they will run the other way. 
our words and our actions need to measure up. And with our actions, we will sometimes plant seeds of faith that can grow in people's lives eventually. And because of that, we can make a difference. As a church here in Cottom, we have made a difference. We're getting good at making differences. With our prayer garden, with the Keeve House, with the way we want to become a hub in the community to share our resources, to make, make this a safe place for people to come. We're known for that strong community spirit, and people like that. We make that difference. The purpose of the church is to equip followers of Jesus, to share the good news, to seek opportunities to share the good news of God's love and Jesus' forgiveness. Jesus holds the key. He opens those doors of opportunity. It's us, 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 up to us to walk through them. Jesus is holy, he is true, and he holds the key. Let's move on to Revelation 3, verse 8. I know your deeds, Jesus says. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Jesus sees what's happening in the church in Philadelphia. He sees what they are doing. He sees your deeds. He hears your words. He understands what's happening in the church of Philadelphia. And he's pleased. He likes what he sees. This is a church that keeps walking through the doors that Jesus opens for them. Jesus unlocks the door and they walk through it without hesitation. This church of all churches is on the right path. And when they walk through those doors, Jesus will not allow anyone to shut those. They are doing Jesus' work. And as long as they keep walking through those doors of opportunity and witness, Jesus will keep opening doors of opportunity and witness. Jesus will do that. Reminds me of the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 25. We call it the parable of the talents, where the master of the household went away for a certain length of time and he left certain servants with certain amounts of money to, to be used in his absence. And while he was away, some of the servants used that money to good effect and, and made profits. But one of the, one of the servants uh, took the money and he put it in the ground because he was afraid of losing it. He didn't use it at all. When the master came back, to those who had been given much and gained much, much was given back. But to those who didn't do use what they were given, even what they had, was taken away. This reminds us that as long as we use what Jesus has given to us and we find those opportunities to witness to other people, he will keep opening doors and he will keep giving us what we need. But then Jesus says this, he says, I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This church in Philadelphia, even though it is doing so many incredible things, has little strength. That sounds like a disadvantage, but it's not. Because it's okay to have little strength. Because in having little strength and understanding that, we learn to rely upon Jesus' strength. We learn to rely on the one who is with us, to know that we are not alone, that when our strength fails, there is one who loves us and is with us, who will give us the strength that we need to do the work of Jesus. I know you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Don't be afraid of not being strong enough. The church in Philadelphia wasn't, and it accomplished more than any other church in Asia Minor. Moving on to verses 9 and 10, Jesus says, I will make those who are a synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews but are not but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Jesus says something interesting here. 
He says that those who are faithful should expect opposition. And he gets specific about the opposition. It comes from two sources. The first source is that it comes from within the church itself. Jesus uses the imagery of the synagogue of Satan. And in that imagery, what he's talking about for our purposes are those religious people who do not walk through the doors that Jesus opens. They are afraid to go through those doors. Jesus holds a key and he's opened the doors. but They don't want to go through them. There are forces within the church that want it to stay where it is, that want it to be static. There are forces within the church that are afraid of change. Someone gets a new idea and someone says, we've never done that before. Someone gets an, an idea for new ministry and someone says, but that's not in the budget. And besides that, we need a new roof. And so ministry gets trampled and new ideas get stopped. There are those who are concerned about those things. And we need to listen to those people. We need to hear their voices. We do indeed. Because they remind us that change brings tension. And tension can bring division. And those people are afraid of the change because they don't want to face those possible upheavals. And so they become timid. But Jesus says this. He says that they will fall down at the feet of those who are not afraid of change. And they will acknowledge Jesus' love. Does this sound like punishment? It might, but it's not. What this speaks of is humility. Those who are concerned about change, Jesus says, even they will eventually have their eyes opened. And they will see the doors that Jesus opens. And eventually they too will walk through those doors with the rest of the church to do the work of Jesus. Even the naysayers will see the light. They will repent and united, the church will move forward to do the work of God. Jesus heals and brings us back together. There is opposition from within and there is opposition also from outside the church. And here is the reality, my friends. The more faithful the church is, the more opposition it should expect. Let's go back to the image of Satan. Satan does not want the church to succeed. And so Satan targets those churches that are willing to walk through the doors that Jesus opens. He targets those churches to try to put a damper on them walking through the doors and doing the work of Jesus. And the more we walk through those doors, the more faithful we are, the more opposition we can expect. And that's why churches that are faithful often feel as though they are being attacked. Because they are. Satan doesn't give two hoots about churches that are standing still and, 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 and static and not doing the work of God, not walking through those doors. He can ignore those. They're already doing the right thing as far as he's concerned. But those churches that are doing the work of Jesus, walking through those doors, those are the ones that Satan attacks. So if everything is smooth sailing in your church, and you have no problems, no discussions, no dissension, no concerns, maybe you need to do something different. Because maybe you're not doing the work of Jesus. Together we walk humbly through those doors. Despite the opposition, we do the work of God. Together, humbly. I want to close off with Revelation 3, verses 11 to 13. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus encourages us to hold fast. 
even in the face of opposition. And when we do that, he gives us three honors. The first honor is this. He makes us the pillar in the temple of God. The temple he's talking about is eternal life with Jesus in God's kingdom. And a pillar is a symbol of strength, a symbol of stability. In, if you look at the ancient world, the architecture of the ancient world of Rome, of, of, uh, of, of Greece, even of, of Britain with Stonehenge, what we see left standing are the pillars. You don't see roofs, you don't see windows, you don't see doors, you don't see walls, you might see floors, but you see those pillars rising up from the earth. Those things remain strong and stable and have done so for 2,000 years, for 5,000 years, for a very, very long time. They endure. Jesus says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will endure forever because of your faith. And then he says this, the second honor. The name of God will be written on us. That's important. Because to have God's name written on us is to say that we belong to God. If you think about farmers back in olden days, they would brand their cattle. And when they branded their cattle, people knew who those cattle belonged to. So if a cow wandered away from the rest of the herd and got found by somebody, the person just had to look at the brand and say, I know where you belong. You belong to that farmer. To have God's name written on us reminds us that we belong to God. We are in his pasture. We are part of his herd. So Jesus writes in us the name of God, but also the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God. We are not just God's people. We are citizens of the New Jerusalem, a place of justice and peace, a place where the lion will lie down with the lamb, where a child will put their hand into the viper's nest, the snake's nest, and will not be bitten. And they will all lie down together in peace. That is our destiny. That is where we belong. That is where we end up when we walk through the doors that Jesus opens for us. Jesus promises that those who overcome will walk through his doors. So here's a question, a final question. When you stand before God and the books of life are opened, will you be numbered amongst the overcomers? Will God's name be upon you? Will the mark of the new Jerusalem be evident upon your life? If so, you'll be welcomed into your heavenly home. You will stand with the overcomers like a pillar in the temple of God, and you will have the name of God and the name of new Jerusalem on you. You've walked through those doors, and you receive the reward of your faithfulness, eternal life with Jesus. Be an overcomer. Friends, there is more here than meets the eye. Choose which way you want to go. Choose wisely, for your choices have eternal consequences. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray. God of grace and glory, shine upon us with the light of heaven. Radiate within the deepest recesses of our souls, so that we may glow in response to your never-ending love and care. How wonderful you are and how good to us. Who are we that you defend us? What have we done to deserve your compassion? Your gifts to us are unearned and undeserved given freely by your grace. For your many blessings, we give you thanks and praise. We give thanks this day for 19 years of ministry here in Cottam. We are grateful for your wisdom, your guidance, your strength, and your patience, which have guided us on this journey together. May the work that we have done together for Jesus continue, perhaps with different names and different faces, but always focused on you, who are the author of all good things. 
in the midst of our praise and thanks, we come with our concerns. For a world divided by prejudice, for people crippled by fear, for families wounded by unforgiveness, for the lonely who need to feel loved, for the hungry who need to be fed, for the prisoners who need to be freed, for all these and more we pray. We remember before you those who suffer from any number of natural disasters that we hear about on this earth. Rains, winds, fires, and flood have taken their toll. And yet we still ask for your protection and blessing as we live within the world of your making. Help us to live with respect in creation and to turn towards you in all things. We pray for those who need healing this day, especially for Mark, Brian, Ron and Carol. We also pray for peace, for families and friends of those who grieve, that they may find comfort in your strength. God of all the ages, we pray with open hearts, knowing that you hear and answer our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name, through whom you gave us a great gift of eternal life. Amen. Well, friends, thanks for joining us again today. We will see you again somewhere, sometime, because God is good. God's care is with us. God's love is with us. With that in mind, go in peace. Amen.